when we were crowded into these three rooms, there weren't any books. Because my father was a, in his work, he emptied the trash for businesses around the community, around St. Louis. And he would bring home things. And uh, one day he brought home an incomplete set of encyclopedia, which was my my real introduction to reading at home. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me today on Literacy Journeys with Linda. I am so excited about my guest today. She is a fabulous author. Her name is Ms. Vivian Gibson from St. Louis, and she's gonna tell us about her literacy journey, how she became an author, what was her childhood like growing up with books, and she is an award-winning author, and you're gonna hear all about that. So let's get started. Thank you, Ms. Gibson. Well, thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Wonderful. Well, you know what? I want to start at the beginning because you're a native St. Louisan. Yes. Tell us about your childhood as far as your literacy. We're focusing on like your literacy background. Okay. Well, I've written a book uh, about just about a year ago now, and it's called The Last Children of Mill Creek. And Mill Creek was a community in downtown St. Louis near Union Station, for some of you who know the city, just east of Grand, all the the way down to about 20th Street, uh, with Market Street being the center of that community. Uh, Mill Creek was demolished in 1959, and I was, in fact, one of the last children to live in this community before it was destroyed, completely demolished, does not exist anymore. There are four buildings that uh, remain from what was 452 acres, 20,000 people. And I was one of those last children. And so my book is about my childhood in this community that does not exist anymore. And most of the children, I was one of the younger ones. So most of those children, the, and many that I write about have passed on. And so not that it was my intention, but it turns out that I have this firsthand account of what occurred there. And luckily I'm writing this history and not someone else much later on who knew nothing about it. So I'm really yeah. proud and happy about that. The whole thought of saying that I lived in a segregated, legally segregated community as a child is probably something that some some readers would could not even imagine. In terms of my journey to literacy, as a poor child, I had seven sisters and brothers, Mm -hmm. Uh, my parents, and the eight children lived in three rooms. Okay. Uh, we had no hot water. We heated our three rooms with a wood-burning stove, which meant we had to chop wood and, and carry wood, had to heat water to bathe, to cook, That's to wash clothes. Even to wash clothes, you had to heat the water. So it was a diff- very, very different time when the world around us was progressing. We were still pretty stuck in what my parents as migrants from the south from the south they were part of that great migration, great migration from, that started in the 1900s went through the first one through about 1940 yeah uh, they were part of part of that we were poor my father was a truck driver and a quartet singer he, uh, <laughs> and a janitor so he had three jobs And for as long as I can remember, he had three jobs. Uh, My mother was a stay-at-home mother who was an artist and a craftsperson. She crocheted and quilted and and did art pieces that she sold to supplement our income. But we were crowded into these three rooms. There weren't any books. Uh, The only books were... Uh, a McCall magazine that came monthly. And because my father was a, in his work, he emptied the trash for businesses around the community, around St. Sure. Louis. And he would bring home things. And uh, one day he brought home an incomplete set of encyclopedia. My, fir- my real introduction to reading at home. 
You know, we were, schools were segregated. Uh, children in our schools probably got the books that, that white children um, <laughs> used before us because they were all without covers and missing pages. Uh, there were never enough. You always had to move your desk over to read with someone on, in, you know, at another yeah. desk. Because they were, and you couldn't take the books home. So my introduction to reading at home, uh, just to get away from all those people in three rooms. Yeah. And because I was a slow reader. So I never would, get to finish my reading at school. So I was perpetually behind because I was a slow reader. So I, it was kind of my attempt to read and finish at my own pace that yeah. I became accustomed and began to enjoy reading alone at home encyclopedia. So I had all this background information. So yes. if there was something that we talked about at school and I could find it in the encyclopedia, soon after that, I probably knew more than most of the kids did oh, uh, because yeah. I, I was reading. So that was really my introduction to reading, the fact that I was a poor reader, a slow reader, and I learned to read alone at my own pace to get the information and to subsequently be become a lover of reading. And so yeah. that's kind of my journey. And I think it's kind of a lesson to children and parents alike that being labeled a slow reader should not be this death knell for a child to yeah. crush their, their energy and their, their self-esteem because there's always a way. Children learn differently. Yes. We didn't really talk about that when I was a kid. And I'm pretty sure there was something in the back of my mind that I was not as smart as everyone else, as, as the girls who got all the spelling questions <laughs> on the, on the, on the uh, Friday spelling bee or, or uh, who could answer all the questions because I couldn't answer them uh, as fully because I didn't get a chance to finish all of it. Or I was so concerned with the fact that the other kids were closing their books and they were finished and I was only halfway through and you get distracted and that sort of thing. So I think my journey to reading and writing is probably very different from a lot of writers. I learned to love reading because I was able and lucky enough to find a source and a place and a time to read for my own edification and, and enjoyment. And you said you started to love reading. Can you remember what was it about it? What were some of the topics that you just, you just gravitate because encyclopedia is so comprehensive. I know, I know, but it, that's what made it so interesting. At, at, at some point I realized that I knew more than they did. Although once in school, once, the, once you read this day, then you moved on to something else. So I rarely had a chance to say, but I know this uh, because you, you move on. But I don't know. I just enjoyed reading about anything. And I, I think initially it had to do with whatever the subject was that day. If we were reading about George Washington. Sure. And he cut down the cherry tree. That's what you learn yeah. in that little passage at school. Mm -hmm. But I, I would read, I'd look him up and, and learn where he lived in, in Virginia and, and that he was, in fact, a, a general before he was president and, and learned about the wars, uh, that sort of thing. So I would get all the details that fascinated me. Um, so it could be anything. So Whatever was, if I would hear a word that I'd never heard before. Uh, in my book, I, I, I write about the, the word, the sycamore tree. We moved and there were trees that I'd never seen in my old neighborhood. Hmm. They look different. Sycamore trees are a lighter, have a lighter colored bark that's almost like taupe or green. Yeah. And I was used to walnut trees that had these deep, rough bark trees that were very, very dark. And immediately I noticed that this tree was different. And, and I asked my mother what kind of tree they were. And she said, sycamore. I went, sycamore, that was like an incredible word. I love yeah. that word. <laughs> Even today, I can't pass a, a sycamore tree without saying, 
Sycamore tree. And you got to read John Grisham's book, Sycamore Row. That's right. I read that. And that's probably, <laughs> that's probably why I picked it up. <laughs> it had the Sycamore. Yes, I did too. I love that book. Well, let me ask you about your your process of actually learning how to read. Was it with your teachers at school, like when you were five or six with the phonics and the Dick and Jane books back with, then? <laughs> I think it was more with my older siblings. My mother had this system where uh, the four older children were responsible for the four younger children. So wow. we, I was matched up with a sister who was like uh, six years, six or seven years older than that than I. And um, responsible means they had to make sure you got up in the morning. So first of all, you have eight kids running around getting ready for school. My mother and father slept in the front room. We didn't have a living room. We had a front room, a middle room, and a kitchen. Okay. And we all we were all there. So my mother kind of stayed out of the way until all of this happened. And we all had our, our assignments and what to do. We knew what we were supposed to do. Yeah, she was smart. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so my sister was, kind of, was in charge for, of me to get me up, make sure I was dressed, make sure I had breakfast, make sure I had my lunch because you took your lunch to school, mm -hmm. any kind of assignment or that sort of thing. And our mother saw us as we passed her bedroom in the morning, she opened the door just to do that final check do you have this? Do you have that? Are you dressed properly? That sort of thing. But my sister, Jean, really took her responsibility seriously. So she like made sure my hair was brushed and she she helped me learn my ABCs, my numbers, that sort of thing. Okay. So I, I would credit her with my initial learning. Now, I want to ask you about your parents supporting you and all your siblings in, in your reading. Because you said your mother went to college and your father had three jobs. And, but he, had, he knew something of value. When he saw those encyclopedias in the church, right. he brought them home. So he knew that was valuable. Absolutely. What did they instill in you as far as your reading? Well, certainly a work ethic because we work. My father was the janitor of, the, of our church. He was also the music director. Mm -hmm. So he would clean the church on, on uh, Tuesday nights until seven o'clock and then the choir started coming in and he stopped cleaning and, and directed the choir <laughs> rehearsal. <laughs> Ooh, lovely. <laughs> but, but as children of the janitor of the church, you, you're helping to clean that church. Children, yeah. we had to go to church and dust the pews and the windows and, and, and vacuum and empty trash and shovel snow in the winter, that sort of thing. So we had a lot of uh, responsibility at the church. And we went to church, so we had Sunday school, and there's a lot of reading and, and memorizing and yes. uh, yeah, speeches, uh, Bible verses, learning the books of the Bible, all of that went on at church. So we had Sunday school, then we had regular service where we were the ushers and we were in the choirs. There was a lot of learning that went on in church. So I would think probably some of my very, very early learning also happened in Sunday school. So you're equipped all these years, you're going into high school now and you're equipped with all this knowledge and, and skill and reading. What happened as far as your literacy in your high school years? Well, I can honestly say I never considered myself a writer. I mean, I wrote, we did reports and research and, and, and those kinds of things. I honestly did not consider be labeled as a writer until I, I was in my late 60s. I had always um, just done what I had to do, never really thinking of it because I was focused on design and, and that sort of thing. I never thought of writing, I just did it. But it wasn't until I retired and uh, was really cleaning out my yes. Tell the story, I love when I read about this story. <laughs> yeah. I, it wasn't until I re retired and decided to clean out my office 
in my home, which was also my second bedroom, of all the papers and committees I've been on and jobs I've had and proposals, just, just file cabinets and stacks and bags and boxes of paper to get rid of them. So I bought a paper shredder. And I began shredding these papers, getting rid of them, getting prepared to just have a bedroom for a change. <laughs> so, and so as I was doing that, I started finding all these things that I'd written over the years that I'd forgotten about. And at, at the end of about two weeks of shredding paper, I had a real stack of writing that really started when I was probably around 27 living in New York when my mother died. Oh. I think that was my first memory of actually starting to write something down because my mother died sort of une unexpectedly and you, you have that loss of time and connection and, and I started to remember all of the things, all the conversations we didn't have. Oh. So I started writing things just to remember my mother and just to, just to, out of a kind of a grief. So I, so apparently the writing went on without me really thinking about it. I, you know, there were t several attempts at journaling that probably lasted two or three weeks yes. that then stopped. Uh, uh, sometimes it was just a memory. Sometimes it was an essay. Sometimes it was a paragraph. Sometimes it was a phrase on the back of an envelope. These were just stray sheets of paper here? Stray there. sheets of paper, not connected, things that I wanted to remember. And I thought, I think I may have thought that at some point I wanted to share these memories with my children because I didn't even have children when my mother died. Mm. <laughs> so it was that was part of it. And, and when I realized what I had and started reading through them and trying, trying to put them in some kind of chronological order or, yeah. or something. I read about a creative writing workshop that was offered for senior citizens. Okay. So I said, maybe I'll, I'll do this and get some ideas about how to pull this all together. Yeah. Again, for family, children, that sort of thing. And I'd never been part of a creative writing group before. They were all retired people, all college educated professionals that had retired and were now writing poetry and memoir and novels that they had probably like me been maybe thinking about over time. So it was a very interesting experience to write. So what I did was I started fleshing out my writings. Sure. Yeah, instead of just starting with whole cloth, I would pick something and, and, and try to make something out of it for this writing workshop. And I just, just fell in love with it. the whole process of writing, having someone read what you wrote, critiquing it so that you could make it better. And I just fell in love with the whole process. And one thing led to another, one story led to another. And the next thing you know, I had all these, these stories that, oh, I, my phone's ringing, but we'll ignore it. Um, <laughs> I had all these stories that I had improved on because of the, the critiquing and, and going back and forth. And uh, it was a process that was just so rewarding for me. Again, I'm retired, I've reinvented myself and I'm just, you know, loving the experience. And, of, and, and Ms. Gibson, you're saying you're loving, what, what kind of emotions, what feelings were you having when you're sitting in this group, this class? Yeah, initially it's terrifying. Because you're really putting yourself out there. Yeah. Um, and it is, it was scary initially. I think in the, now this went over uh, probably about three years. So oh. that first year or so, it was, it was terrifying. I, I don't think I submitted anything to be read for the first probably six classes. I just listened and, and read other people's. And that was, that was okay. They said, you know, it's a process. Eventually you realize that everybody was there for the same reason and probably having the same feelings yes. and were vulnerable 
the, wow. the same way I was. And once you realize that everybody's there to support and to help you improve yes. your writing, it became a lot easier. I, I, I look forward to it. I really did yes. enjoy it. So eventually the leader of the workshop said to me, these are really good. You should submit them to a literary magazine. I went, what? Are you kidding me? <laughs> this is for my kids. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Oh my so God. Eventually I did submit something and, it, and I felt pretty safe because it was a, a request for black women to submit just 500 words uh, about themselves, about okay. as a black woman, your experience as a black woman, that was it. So I could write anything that had to do with me as a black woman to this theater group in New York. Mm -hmm. And uh, they accepted it. Yeah. And it was part of a production uh, in, in a Brooklyn theater, uh, similar to our, our uh, Black Repertory Theater here in St. Louis. And it was produced and I went, oh my goodness. So I got a little braver and again, I submitted something to a anthology on St. Louis. They wanted stories about living in St. Louis from okay. anybody who had something to say. <laughs> so I submitted one story about my grandmother's experience as a domestic, and mm -hmm. it was called Sun Up to Sun Down. Mm -hmm. And it was about how she had to get up at sun up to, to get to work in Clayton or Ladue to, in time to ready little white children to go to school and then clean and cook and do laundry and then get on the streetcar and come back home mm -hmm. by the time it was sundown. <laughs> I submitted that story. Um, and it was accepted. The interesting thing about that was I was so nervous about it that the deadline was midnight on this night. And I submitted it about 10 minutes to 12. <laughs> I just went wow. mm -hmm. uh, and sent it. And the very next morning, the editor of the um, anthology text mm -hmm. emailed me and said that he was just reading what I'd submitted over his coffee. Okay. And that he loved it. Did I have any more? So uh, one thing led to another. A year and a half later, I had a book. <laughs> There's a lot in between, but that's the gist of it. How's your life changed now? My life is so full. I, I don't know if, if it's because of the pandemic, but I'm selling marketing books from this kitchen counter right here via Zoom because my book was due out April 20th, about a month before that, the whole country locked down. Yes. And so all of my book launchings and book signings were all canceled. And so I've been selling this book and talking to people about this book via Zoom for the last year. And I've been on several bestseller list. I've gotten all kinds of wonderful international reviews. And so the book is doing well. I want you to, Ms. Gibson, talk to the audience about the value of literacy, the value of reading and writing for these young people. I mean, I just love how your dad just brought those books home and why and then I was curious enough to pick them up. I think that's, that's what's important. I, I, I said earlier, the children learn, people learn differently. And I think you have to find children where they are in their learning. Uh, it could have been, my brothers read comic books, but, you know, but they were reading. Um, I think you have to make sure that children have access to books at a level and an interest that, 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 that they have. I think that's the most important to try to create this love of reading. If, you know, if we were reading Dick and Jane and Spot sure. at school, I mean, the, the, there were no black children in these books. 
their experiences were totally different from ours. We didn't think about it then. And these days, you know, hopefully the children can see themselves in the books when they're first learning to read. But I think it's so important to give them something, something to read about that they're interested in, you know, not to force children to read what you want them to read. If they're interested in, in superheroes or, or if they're interested in trucks or um, science fiction, make sure that you have something available that they're interested in and they will read. And they and it grows, it feeds on itself uh, to, for children to learn that there's something that can be garnered from, from, from that interest and from those words on their, on their page. I remember my son, uh, we didn't realize he needed glasses. You know, he was standing in front of the TV too close and we were saying, get back. Uh -huh. And uh, we were reading to him. He had an older sister. We read to him, we did all the right things. And then one day, we realized that he was memorizing the books and that he wasn't in fact reading the words. He could, he could read the word elephant because it was long, and, but he couldn't when we thought that, oh, if he can read elephant, let's have him reading himself. And he couldn't figure out cat wow. because he had a reading disorder. Plus he couldn't see. He couldn't really see. And so even at school, when the teacher was writing on the board, he was too far back. And so it was just gibberish to him. And I remember the day that we finally figured that out, got him glasses. We came out of the doctor's office with his new glasses on. He looked up and looked at a tree and realized that leaves were individual leaves and not this kind of cotton candy shape. And then he looked at a book and he says, oh, I want to know at what this, what is on this page? He, all this time, he didn't even know that he couldn't read, that, so, you know, it's something that's, and we were educated people. We were doing all the right things, yeah. but he until you realize that children can see that that uh, they that they if they have a learning disability, you have to figure out how to manage that disability. Yeah. Just because you have a disability doesn't mean that it can't be managed. Yeah. Managed children have to learn in the way that they learn, yeah. and teachers for and educators often teach to the middle. The children who are really really bright are off in this direction or children who are really struggling are off in this one. And so maybe only half of the kids are really learning in a way that they need to learn. Yeah. And so I think parents have to pay attention and ask questions. You know, if a, if a teacher says he's not reading up to level, but there's a reason. Let's talk about why and how and what to do about it. And it's not always just taking them out or labeling them uh, as slow learners or whatever. They learn differently. And so I think there's a lot to be said for parents to really pay attention, ask questions and give children what they need to inspire them, to keep them curious. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been so excited to listen to Miss Vivian Gibson. She has an award-winning book, The Last Children of Mill Creek, and I'll have a link in the description box so you can go to her website and learn all about her and her work. And thanks again for joining me. If you like these uh, videos that I'm doing, these interviews, please click that subscribe button and I will talk to you and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Gibson. Thank you, thank you for having me. Bye.